In this video, we will be looking at the basic functions of the RDI radar in the Mirage 2000C, specifically those used during beyond visual range air-to-air -air detection and interception. We will go over the elementary concepts of a pulse Doppler radar, the PCR or radar control panel and recommendations for HOTAS bindings, the extensive radar symbology on the VTB, the initial RESH or range while bar search mode, the PSID track while scan mode, the PSIC single target track mode, and a basic use of the mode 4 IFF interrogation. Hello fellow virtual aviators, we are back in the perspicacious Mirage 2000C and today we'll be looking at operating the radar for air-to-air -air use, focusing today just on beyond visual range techniques. We are currently flying over the American unincorporated territory of Guam in the Pacific Ocean, where a number of aircraft, both enemy and friendly, are passing overhead. Today won't specifically be about weapons employment, simply locating, identifying, tracking and locking targets, and we will look at air-to-air -air combat in a future tutorial. The Mirage's RDI radar, located in its nose cone, is pretty effective for a late 1980s fourth generation fighter, and is of the pulse Doppler variety. Feel free to skip the next section if you're already familiar with radar use, but first, a presentation on some important concepts. In this section, we will go over some of the elementary concepts of using an onboard, airborne pulse Doppler radar, and what you will need to consider to get the most out of air-to-air -air interception. A pulse Doppler radar is the standard radar equipment carried by many fighter aircraft. The radar is used to detect other aircraft to provide the pilot with situational awareness. The pulse Doppler radar works by sending out a pulse of radiation in the radio range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Large metal objects such as aircraft will reflect this radiation back towards the emitting aircraft, which can be detected by onboard equipment. By measuring the time taken for the signal to return and its phase shift due to the Doppler effect, the range and velocity of the target object can be determined. This is normally displayed visually to the pilot on a radar screen. By taking multiple pulse measurements, the radar equipment is able to build up a picture of how the target is moving. This enables the radar to track the target, which will be vital for its interception and employment of weapons against it. For the pilot to use his radar effectively, they must be able to manipulate the radar in such a way to ensure the electromagnetic radiation shines on the target so that it reflects. To help them do that, the pilot can change the shape, size, and direction of the radar beam in terms of azimuth, scan pattern, and elevation. To cover a section of the sky, the radar antenna in the nose of the aircraft moves backwards and forwards laterally. This is called a radar sweep. Looking from above, the radar azimuth represents the sector area that the radar is sweeping and any target aircraft within the area has the potential to be detected. The pilot can adjust the size of the sector area to cover a greater section of the sky. However, in doing so, the radar sweep takes longer to complete a full sweep, which means it may take longer for the target aircraft to be detected. Typically, a pulse Doppler radar used for airborne interception has three or four settings, for example, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, and 60 degrees either side of the aircraft's longitudinal axis. A larger azimuth means more of the sky is being scanned, but the trade-off is the speed of the complete sweep. Consider these two bandits here. The trailing bandit would not be picked up in the 15 degree sweep, so the pilot may not come to know about it. It would be detected in both the larger sweeps, but would be detected quicker and have a stronger track buildup in the 30 degree sweep, as it will receive more pulses per unit time. Likewise, the radar antenna in the nose of the aircraft can scan several lines or bars of the sky. 
This is called a radar scan pattern. Looking from the side, the radar bars represent the vertical area that the radar is sweeping, and again, any target aircraft within the area has the potential to be detected. The pilot can adjust the number of bars scanned to cover a greater section of the sky. As the radar completes its sweep laterally, the radar antenna will adjust upwards slightly to cover another bar. As shown here, the blue sweep is covering two bars. Again, however, in doing so, the radar sweep takes longer to complete its full cycle, which means it may take longer for the target aircraft to be detected. Bars usually overlap slightly to ensure full coverage. Typically, a pulse Doppler radar used for airborne interception has three settings for bars, for example, one bar, two bars, and four bars. More bars means a greater area of the sky scanned at the expense of how quickly you can detect the potentially hostile targets. Consider these two bandits here. The trailing bandit at the higher altitude is just on the cusp of the two bar pattern. There is a chance it would not be detected. It would be detected in the four bar pattern, but would take longer to be detected and again, the radar track may not be as strong. So the pilot must take into consideration and decide upon which settings give them the optimum chance of detecting targets. What is more important? To confidently know the location of one threat at the expense of not knowing about another, or having a greater picture of situational awareness of all threats at the expense of accuracy. This is a decision the pilot must make even before we consider the concept of radar lock and weapons employment. In addition to azimuth and bars, most airborne pulse Doppler radars used for interception allow the pilot to slew the antenna up and down in a tilting motion to cover different areas of the sky. Consider this plumb line, which runs directly through this bandit aircraft at 30,000 feet. At this distance to the plumb line, my radar is covering the sky between 24,000 and 16,000 feet. This altitude range is often displayed on the radar screen next to the target designator, cursor or alidade. Consequently, the bandit would go undetected in this situation. Tilting my antenna downwards would allow me to cover a lower area of the sky, say between 13 and 5,000 feet, and tilting my antenna upwards, an area of say between 35 and 27,000 feet. It would only be by tilting my radar antenna upwards that I would have detected this bandit under these parameters. The range of altitudes covered depends on the range to the target. This is a lot of information for the pilot to consider, and often they must make decisions on these matters quickly and decisively. Taking control of and using a pulse Doppler radar can seem daunting at first, but with practice you will master the art of its many parameters and will learn when and where to use each control. In terms of control, I recommend that you have bound to your keyboard or HOTAS controls for adjusting the azimuth, the number of bars, the antenna elevation, the radar screen range scale, and importantly, controls to move your target designator. By combining and mastering these, you will set yourself on course to becoming a good interceptor. Thank you for listening, and let's see how these concepts apply to the Mirage 2000C. Most of the radar controls in the cockpit are located here on the PCR, the Poste de Commande Radar, or the radar control panel. To allow us to see the panel clearly, I have removed the throttle for which there is a control binding in the options. Our focus today will just be on the controls needed for air-to-air. -air. In my opinion, I would have the majority of these controls bound to keys or switches on your HOTAS so that you aren't looking down and manipulating the panel with the mouse. The large knob with the chevron symbol is the radar power switch and has four options. Off, the radar is not operational. Warm up, this is used to ready the radar during our starter procedure. Standby, the radar is functional but is silent and not emitting any electromagnetic radiation. And emit, the radar is functional, emitting and searching for returns. Most of the air-to-air -air controls are at the bottom of the panel. 
The size of the radar azimuth is controlled with this switch here, and has three options, 15, 30, and 60 degrees either side of the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. This switch controls the radar scan pattern or the number of bars, and has three options, one, two, and four bars. This corresponds to a vertical coverage of approximately three degrees, five degrees, and 10 degrees respectively. The two and four bar patterns overlap each other, which may result in duplicated contacts as we will see later. This button adjusts not the range of the radar, but the range scale shown on the VTP display. This is useful for adjusting if we need to see further out and scan for targets at a greater distance. There are two important radar controls on the throttle itself. The first is the radar designator joystick, which moves the TDC, or Allidade, on the radar screen. By depressing the switch, we can designate a target. The second, which cannot be seen here, is the antenna elevation control, which adjusts the elevation of the radar. These controls cannot be manipulated with the mouse, so must definitely be bound to a key or HOTAS switch. This is the radar presentation switch, and can be set to either PPI, or Plan Position Indicator mode, or B, the B-scope mode. Generally, I leave this set to PPI, and only switch it to B-scope mode when I'm searching for targets at close range. This switch toggles whether or not to display the altitude information on the Allidade as a range or as a central node. My preference is to leave this on the left setting, the angle mode, at all times. This is the radar persistence knob. If the knob is set to N, or no, if a radar contact detected in a one bar sweep is not detected in the subsequent sweep, the radar return is removed from the VTB screen. If set to R, remanence, or persistence, the contact will remain for a further two sweeps even if it is not detected again. This could be useful if your target is difficult to track. The switch in the center with three options is the Pulse Repetition Frequency Selector, and changes how frequent the radar emits its pulses of electromagnetic radiation. HFR represents a high frequency, and is best employed when your targets have a high closing or opening speed. BFR represents a low frequency, and is best employed when your target is traveling tangential to you or has a low closing speed. ENT, or interleave mode, employs both modes sequentially in each radar suite. The button marked STT, or PSIC in the French cockpit, toggles a radar lock between a PSID track while scan and a PSIC single target track. A PSIC single target track is required for radar guided weapons employment. The VTB is the main instrument for displaying radar information. It has a two color screen which displays information clearly. Eight two way switches flank the side of the screen. We have already used one of these, the N switch, in a previous video to set our bullseye, and the others. Uh, are used in manual target designation, which we will cover in a future episode. This switch is the main VTB screen power switch. Set it to forward to turn the VTB on. This is something we normally do during startup. These four dials control various aspects of the VTB's brightness and contrast, with values between 0 and 7. This switch toggles between the display of the radar and a fore and aft navigational awareness mode. Please note that in this mode, no radar information is displayed. It only shows things like validated tactical waypoints. So it's useful for helping to visualize your navigation path. This is the declutter switch or Aleg in the French cockpit 
and is used to remove certain symbology from the display, for example tactical waypoints, useful if the information on the screen is becoming too hectic. My own aircraft is represented on the VTB by this triangle, with the radar viewing what is in front of me. This arrow is my vector arrow and gives a visualization of my direction of travel and velocity. The position of my aircraft on this heading tape shows my aircraft's heading, allowing me to monitor this without moving my eyes from the VTB. Other repeated information used in a similar manner is shown at the bottom of the VTB. This is my airspeed in knots and Mach number. And this is my barometric altitude in hundreds of feet. 137 means my altitude is 13,700 feet. We have already seen this information used in our tactical navigation video, which shows range and bearing from a chosen point to the Allardade, employed for example when using a mission bullseye. This is the Allardade, or TDC cursor, and this can be manipulated using my TDC controls. There is a moving repeater line on the heading tape to show in which bearing the Allardade is pointing. The number on the left of the Allardade represents the distance in nautical miles from my own aircraft to the position of the Allardade's cursor. 13 nautical miles, 24 nautical miles, 35 nautical miles. My radar scale is currently set to 40 nautical miles, indicated by this number at the top. From this point to my aircraft is 40 miles. By using the radar range scales control, this can be adjusted at set values between 10 and 320 nautical miles. You are unlikely to pick up an enemy fighter at these ranges. My preferred range settings are 80 nautical miles while searching and 40 and 20 nautical miles when targeting. This arc represents the size of the radar azimuth, and you can see a marker passing backwards and forwards to represent the radar sweep. We can change the size of the azimuth with the radar azimuth switch. 15 degrees, you'll see the arc is now smaller. And usefully in the Mirage, the arc follows the position of the Allardade, so you can pan left and right while still maintaining a small azimuth. Remember that the radar will only scan to the width of the azimuth set. Thirty degrees is my preferred azimuth setting, but I do use all three during interception. The two numbers on the right of the Allardade indicate the radar elevation and show the maximum and minimum altitudes in thousands of feet being scanned at the range of the Allardade's position. So, thinking back to the plumb line concept in the presentation, I am scanning between 20,000 and 8,000 feet at this position, 14 nautical miles in front of me. Using the radar elevation controls, I can tilt my radar up and down to cover different altitude ranges, tilting down, and tilting up. The scale on the left side of the VTB screen helps visualize the radar elevation. This marker line shows where the radar is pointing vertically, with the center of the scale representing straight ahead. Each subsequent scale marking represents 10 degrees up or down. You will see that the marker line is moving up and down periodically. That is because we are set to a 4-bar scan pattern. As it makes a sweep, the antenna moves upwards to select the next bar before sweeping back. After completing the full 4-bar pattern, it returns to the bottom of the pattern and repeats. The number 4 shows we have 4 bars selected, and we can change this with the radar bars switch.
The letters here show which pulse repetition mode my radar is set to. High frequency, low frequency, or interleaved mode. In general, I keep this on high repetition frequency unless my situation calls for a change. These two numbers show the radar channels you are operating on, something that is not modelled currently in DCS. This displays which track or lock mode my radar will place a target in when I designate them with the Allidade. PID is short for PSID, which is equivalent to other aircraft's track while scan mode. PIC is short for PSIC, which is equivalent to other aircraft's single target track mode. This can be changed when I am in search mode as I am now, and do not have a target designated. Pressing the STT or PSIC button toggles between the two preset modes. I prefer this to be set to PSID mode as default. The symbols at the centre are known as the aircraft model and horizon, useful for maintaining awareness of your pitch and roll when you are heads down. When the model is aligned perfectly with the horizon, you are straight and level. So let's now look at how contacts are displayed and interacted with in HFR high frequency repetition mode. In this mode, filters in the radar software discern the raw radar returns for you and present possible contacts on the screen as chevrons. The direction of the chevron indicates how you are closing on the target, not the direction of the target's travel. A downward chevron means you are closing on the target, and an upward chevron means the target is getting away. The number at the side of the target chevron indicates the closure or opening speed in Mach number. Because the bars in my scan pattern overlap, it is entirely possible for an aircraft to be picked up twice during the same scan. This is happening here, I can see two chevrons appearing, but don't be fooled, this is the same aircraft. Notice also, in this situation, if I move the Allidade over to the right, the contact that was at the top left has disappeared. And that doesn't mean that the aircraft isn't there anymore, we're just not picking it up, we're not scanning it. So by moving the Allidade back across and allowing the sweep to pass over it, it has reappeared. Occasionally, you will see chevrons with small horizontal lines attached. These indicate that the contact was detected in the top or bottom bars of a two or four bar search. The top if the horizontal lines are at the top, and the bottom if the horizontal lines are at the bottom. Currently, we are in range while bar search mode, known as RESH mode, Recherche en ligne mode in French. This means our radar is emitting radiation and measuring any returns it detects. We are not tracking or locking any aircraft at the moment, but can do so with the Allidade. By moving the Allidade over a radar return with the TDC controls and pressing TDC to press, we enter PSID mode, or track while scan mode. PSID stands for Poursuite sur Information Discontinue in French. I know I am in PSID mode as I now have some additional symbology, most obviously this radial line which shows the target I am tracking. PSID mode allows me to track one target whilst also keeping an eye on the surrounding sky for other contacts. Uh, it does this by uh, concentrating most of its radar power on the PSID track target but continues to dedicate some power to search for other contacts in the vicinity. The distance to the track target is displayed to its left, and the two vertical lines mark the track I am interested in. The vector arrow shows the calculated direction of travel of the track target, with the attached number representing the number of degrees left or right of the radial line running between my own aircraft and the target. In other words, he is flanking me 20 degrees to my right. By tracking a target in PSID mode, my radar can calculate some additional information about it and display it at the top of the VTB. 
This is my track target speed in Mach number. This is its calculated heading in degrees. He is travelling south-southwest at 204 degrees true. This is the calculated closure rate between us, the combined velocity if you like. You will see that as the track target maneuvers and its velocity vector changes, this number will change. And the final number is the track target's calculated barometric altitude in hundreds of feet, in this case currently 10,100 feet. I can undesignate the target by pressing Weapon System Command Depress. This will place me back into Resh Range while Bar Search mode. Let's redesignate that target as our PCID track target, and I can see that although he is travelling away from me, I am closing as I have a downward facing chevron and a positive closure rate. Now what I can do is concentrate all my radar's power on that target, something known as a single target track. When I have a target designated in PSID, I can press the STT TWS toggle button to transform it into a PSIC single target track. I know I am in PSIC mode as I no longer have the full arc. It is concentrated on the target, and all other radar contacts have disappeared from the screen. I have essentially locked the target. And this set of asterisks has also appeared in the bottom right, these are part of the Mirage's non-cooperative target recognition system, and if your target is in the right aspect and conditions, this will tell you what type of aircraft you are locking. I can unlock the target by coming out of PSIC mode, done by pressing the STT TWS toggle button once again, bringing me back into PSID track while scan mode. And I can return to Resh Search Mode by pressing the Weapon System command to press once again. I am in pursuit of this target, which I have in a PSIC single target track. Well, let's see what happens. He is maneuvering. I can see that he's turning hot on me. And my radar has determined that the contact is a MiG-21 fish bed, so let's go and see him. I can see I have another contact here while in search mode, and I can go straight to a P6 single target track by setting the mode to pick on the display, so that when I designate it with the Allidate, it goes straight to single target track. Let's press the STT button there to change it to PIC, P6. And if we now designate the target with the Allidate, it should take me straight to that single target track. You shouldn't really rely on the non-cooperative target recognition feature to identify friends from foes. We are going to employ the Mirage's Mode 4 Interrogation Friend or Foe Transponder. Hopefully you have some basic understanding of how these work, but essentially the transponder sends out a signal that can be interpreted by friendlies, who then return a signal to you to show that they are on your side. 
The IFF interrogator is controlled on this panel here on the right console. Most of it, unfortunately, is not currently simulated in DCS. Uh, but we do need to select some uh, options using the two knobs on either side. There are different types of IFF interrogation and we are going to use mode 4, which is selected using this knob here, so make sure that is set to number 4. The knob on the right controls how the signal is broadcast. Off, the system is obviously switched off. Sect, the interrogation signal is broadcast in a 20 degree beam around the Allidade. And Cont or Full, the signal is broadcast across the whole of the radar scan. With the broadcast knob set to full, pressing and holding the nose wheel steering IFF interrogate button will send out the signal to the contacts I can see on the radar screen. I know the signal is being broadcast because the arc at the top of the VTB doubles. I can see here I have three contacts on the screen and one of them is a friendly. I am going to use mode 4 interrogation to find out which. So pressing and holding the IFF interrogate button, I see that the contact at the top left uh, has diamond icons next to it. If the diamond icon appears, that means that the aircraft is returning a friendly squawk from its IFF system. So I can be pretty sure that the left contact there is a friendly, whereas the other contact, where there are no diamond symbols, I can be pretty sure that that is a neutral or enemy. With the broadcast mode set to sector, the system will only interrogate along a radial towards the Allidade. So pressing and holding, you'll see that the interrogation arc at the top of the screen is only covering a 20 degree angle. So I'm pretty sure the contact on the right is a hostile, so let's bring him into PC track while scan mode, and let's go and intercept him. Whilst in PC mode, if my radar deduces that the track is not strong enough to maintain, it can suggest to me that I switch to P6 single target track so that I don't lose them. It does this by flashing p in the center of the VTB, so if I see this, I should consider switching to an STT immediately, locking the target and keeping him in check. Conversely, if I am in PSIC mode and I try to change back to PSID by pressing the STT TWS toggle, my radar will override this decision and keep me in PSIC if it thinks that switching to PSID will lose the track. It does this by displaying a struck through PSID in the center of the VTB. If I wish to override this myself and definitely come out of PSIC into PSID, I simply press the STT TWS toggle again whilst the PSID symbol is displayed. If, for whatever reason, I unexpectedly lose a radar lock on a target, the RDI radar has a cool memory feature which presents the lost target as a yellow ghost contact on the VTB. Using the last known trajectory and velocity of the target, the VTB then predicts where the target should be. This is useful for reacquisition. And you can see here the ghost target is moving away from me, so I'm going to search in this area to see if I can find the target. If you want to remove the ghost contact and its information, you can press the RAS reset option with the theta button on the left hand side of the VTB.
Well, as ever, I hope that was useful for you and you have started to develop your radar skills in the Mirage 2000C. With thanks to my sponsor, Yan11, feel free to do the usual thing, like, subscribe, comment and share. But until next time, Virtual Aviators, I look forward to seeing you online in the skies. This is Reva saying, last call.